All right, awesome. Okay, so um, if you all don't know, um, this organization is Black Health. We were founded in 19, and oh Jesus, in 1987, and we were formerly the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. Um, we have since rebranded, and now we are the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. Um, we rebranded to be able to include a lot of other health disparities that affect African Americans, including cardiovascular disease, um, high uh, blood pressure, um, diabetes, mental health, um, breast cancer, a plethora of other diseases that we wanted to include in our confidence that we got a handle on um, on HIV with all of the awareness, with the new um, technology, drugs. Um, it's not the death sentence that it once was um, in the 80s when this organization um, began. And so in 2019, we became Black Health to include other things that affect our community, okay? Um, so today, this webinar is titled Orthopox Virus. What is this? Um, I know that we've been hearing a lot um, on the news of what seems like a new pandemic right now. And um, we thought that it was important to talk to you all, um, give you all what we know um, so far. And we have, sorry, I'm trying to admit people and go through this. All right. We have an amazing presenter today. Um, she is back. I hope that I'm I hope I'm I, I'm it's, I'm okay to say this. She's back from maternity leave, and she has a beautiful, a beautiful little girl that we have just been gushing over. She is so cute, and I wish that this webinar was about her because we could really just watch a whole side slide of um of her right now. But um, so Dr. Stella Staffo is a board certified HIV primary care physician, a public health advocate, and the founder of. of of Just Equity for Health, a healthcare improvement company that uses advocacy, education, and care model design to ensure equitable care. Dr. Sappho also provides clinical care to patients in New York. Her work has, be, has been featured in various academic and popular media, including CNN and MSNBC. Okay, so we are going to, this is the agenda. Um, so we, we did the, the welcome, we did the introduction. Um, we are going to get started on the poll right now. All righty. So let me go ahead and launch this poll. And you all let me know if you can see it. Yes. All right. Um, yep, we got it. Okay. So if anyone can't see it, just drop something in the, just drop a comment in the chat box and we'll pick up on it. So the first question is, what is your knowledge level on orthopox virus? Okay. Are you very knowledgeable? Are you knowledgeable? Are you somewhat knowledgeable? Are you not at all knowledgeable? Or did you think that we were here to learn about monkeypox? And we'll give you all a couple of moments. Um, all right, let's see that. And these um, these answers are anonymous. We can't see who's saying what. We'll give you all a couple more seconds. Okay, a lot of people participating. Come on. There's about four more of you. If we can just get you involved. All right. Okay. All right. So 16% of you are knowledgeable. 41% of you are somewhat knowledgeable. 
uh, another 41% not at all. And 3% of you thought we were here to talk about monkeypox. All right. This is great. Um, thank you so much for your honesty with this. I know that, you know, all of you have been around during coronavirus and have put in so much time and effort and service in um, to be you know, of service for your communities and coronavirus. And we absorbed so much information during coronavirus. And I know for a lot of us now having orthopox virus come in, also known as monkeypox or previously known as monkeypox, that's where our confusion comes in. Um, it's it's been hard for some of us to adjust to making more room in our minds and our learning ability and just our overall mental construct to be able to say, well, now this new virus exists and how am I going to learn about it? And so thanks for your honesty. Um, there's definitely a lot for us still to learn. And um, our, our session today with Dr. Staffel is going to be really enlightening around that. So thanks for your honesty and don't be afraid at all to ask questions. This is new for all of us. You can put up your hand at any time. You can drop um, questions into the chat box. And we're going to try and inch all of us up a bit on the knowledge level um, as the night goes on. Okay. And so we have a couple more polls um, before we before we get started. And let me go back. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Anu here. She's a pediatrician and she's also a part of COVID Courage. And many of you have been seeing her um, when we did a lot of our community engagement um, webinars. Um, you've been seeing her and um, as well as uh, Janine. Janine's not here this time. Hopefully we'll see her next time. But um, you know, many of you already know Dr. Anu. So she's here and she'll be helping to, to moderate this evening. Um, so I want to launch, go ahead and launch the next question. It's about vulnerability. Um, how vulnerable do you personally feel towards this virus? Okay. Extremely vulnerable, very vulnerable, vulnerable, somewhat vulnerable. I don't feel vulnerable. I doubt I'll be exposed to the virus. So we kind of just want to gauge how, what you're thinking so far. Ooh. And again, don't be worried. It's anonymous. We can't see whose answer is linked to who. Right. So go ahead. I just see numbers and just percentages. Okay. This is good. And again, if you cannot see um, the poll, you can either you know let us know in the chat, number one, and then you can also put your answer in the chat. Um, I know some of you may be joining from your cellular device, so uh, the, the webinar may present differently. Okay. All right, come on. Anyone else? All right. So 7% uh, of you feel extremely vulnerable. 20% um, of you very vulnerable. 17% of you vulnerable. 37% somewhat vulnerable. And 20% of you don't feel vulnerable at all and doubt that you'll even be exposed to the virus. Okay. This is great to see too. And, you know, we have a spread of folks, right? From New York, to Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia. Um, and so it's interesting when we think about our own exposure and what, and what that does for us, right? I know during, again, having just, you know, being transitioning from the, the kind of experience we've had with COVID, our feeling of personal vulnerability and the vulnerability of our families had a lot to do with how we responded to the virus and what we were willing to do. And so it's really, that's why we really wanted to ask you like, how vulnerable do you personally feel? Because it has a lot to do with how we respond and how we respond to folks in the community. Um, so thanks again for your honesty with this answer. All right, and then one more uh, poll. So with this one, we wanna know how you're feeling, okay? Um, your feelings matter. So how do you feel today about orthopox virus in your community? Are you just over it? Like you're over all of these viruses, all of these, these whatever it is that we're going through right now. Are you just over it? Are you scared? Are you a bit worried? Are you tired of all of this? Are you frustrated? Do you feel prepared? Do you feel unprepared? 
Are you feeling like this is generally our new normal? Um, are you not worried at all? You know, it'll pass. Are you numb? Do you not feel anything? Let us know how you're feeling right now. And like I said, please feel free to, to be as honest, as transparent as you can, because we have a great physician here who is going to tell us everything that she knows. She's very honest, she's relatable, and she speaks in language that we understand. Okay. All right, one more moment. Okay. All right, so 6% of you, y'all are over it, okay? Y'all ready, y'all Y'all are done. Uh, six. Another 6%, you all are scared. 39% of you are worried. 16% of you, they just, y'all tired. Um, 3% are frustrated. Another 3% feel prepared. No one feels unprepared, okay? 23% um, of you feel like this is our new normal. 3% of you are worried. Oh, not worried, I'm sorry. And you all feel like it'll pass. Okay. Wow. Thank you. All right. Um, so before we, we get into Dr. Sappho's presentation, we kind of want to have an idea of what's going on um, where you're from. And I know, um, like Dr. Anu said, you all are from different, um, different states, um, different cities around New York. Um, there's even a difference between New York City and New York State. Um, so we want to know, what are you all hearing? So if you would like to uh, answer this question, you can either put your responses in the chat or you can raise your hand. And if you don't mind being on screen or even you can, you can be off screen and just, and just speak. Um, but here's your opportunity to kind of get some stuff off your chest. Barney, are you clapping because you're excited or you, you want to speak? No, I, I raised my hand. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Barney. Yeah, uh, actually, I haven't been hearing anything. You know, um, I don't think the people, um, you know, the uh, community is worried about the monkey box because that issue hasn't come up. You know, um, it, uh, you would think that more people would be uh, worried, but I think uh, the majority of people feel the same way I feel, you know, from what they've heard, you know, or what they might know about getting the virus, you know, and that's through contact, you know, or sharing sheets or towels or something with somebody. And I don't really think right now people worry because, you know, the, the restrictions they put on who can get it versus who can't. And Barney, you're in New York City, right? Where, where, yes, where are you Harlem, at? New York. Uh -huh. Harlem, you know, Harlem, New York. Great, thank you. <laughs> That's really interesting. I think we have Rosie Polino. You have your hand up too. Thanks, Barney. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rosie Polino. I'm from Waterline International. I hear some member of the community concerned about the monkey packs or up to the pack. Some of them are kind of concerned. Some of them um, have played the role of misinformation information because they said that you went out Rosie can you all hear Rosie no I couldn't I thought it was me but I, I can't hear her okay Rosie what I can go on that they were seeing on song Rosie can you repeat the last thing you said you kind of went out so basically, we are doing canvassing in the community that we're working with the um, COVID program, um, vaccine reluctance, and people now, they don't want to talk about the COVID vaccine. Everything is where I can go and get the monkey pack vaccine. So it seems like the community are reacting to it. Okay. And That's you're in the Bronx, right, Rosie? Yes, I'm in the South Bronx. I'm working in the area of Hunt Point. Um, and the area 10459, 10456, and 10, 
stand for six zero. So that's so interesting because, you know, from Barney, you know, even within the same city, we're seeing such a difference in people's feeling of, you know, the urgency or the vulnerability or the risk. It's really great. Thank you for that. I see Juliet, you put your hand up too. Yes, well, I experienced Washington Heights where people are, some people are knowledgeable, but some people are confused and some people are scared because um, I was even asked one day if I could go and look at a kid in the park to try to see if he had it because they saw blisters all over him. And I was like, that's not appropriate. Just, just if you feel uncomfortable, then just don't play over in that area, have your child play in that area, but I'm not gonna go and look at another child and say, yay, nay, or whatever. That's up to a medical professional to decide that. So it's different in each area, I think. Okay, thank you, Juliet. Thank you, Juliet. I'm just going to, I, I see some other hands up. I'm just gonna read out in the chat um, from Gary. We have, um, a comment, it says little information has been provided, but what has been said is it can be contracted by physical touch. In the beginning, it was sexual transmission. Now they're saying by touch, it's all confusing, little knowledge and understanding of what to share. Thank you for that. And we have from Coach Dave, I'm not eligible for the vaccine. I'm not in the at-risk group. Those in the at-risk group are scared. And what I, what I mean by that is, most of us, you have to deal with the population that's catching it. And the ones who's catching it are really scared because it's painful and it's getting misdiagnosed. People are going into doctors and they don't know what's wrong with them. And it takes them two or three visits to get the right diagnosis. And by the time they get it, now they got to go through the painful part. If they were diagnosed correctly in the beginning, then it wouldn't be that bad. But basically, they told me I'm not eligible for the vaccine because I'm not in the right population. Yep, thank you. Thank you for that, Coach Dave. Um, Loretta, you have your hand up? Hello, I'm on. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Okay, I'm from the Bronx, New York. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, in New York, well, maybe it's just the Bronx, I don't know. But uh, we have, I think, 150,000 people that are at risk for the infection. And it um, seems like whenever anything happens, it starts over here. I don't know what that's all about. But the mayor has declared it a, a health emergency in New York. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are frightened, a lot of people that are tired, you know. Because we got hit hard with, we, you know, we always get hard, hit hard with so many things. Yeah. And uh, the governor is trying to secure more doses. Um, so that's, that's where we stand at right now. That's great. Thank you, for Loretta, for that. Yeah, it's like, that's why I, it's, it's interesting that, I, I, that we didn't see 100% people, of people fatigued. Because in my mind, like, it's the same people keep getting hit, right? And um, we're just glad that you're all here and that you're logged in and that you're willing to learn more. And like kudos to all of you for showing up and being willing to take more on, learn more, be more knowledgeable and share that because it takes a lot. And we're really, really grateful for you. Um, we're gonna move on in a second um, to Dr. Safo's presentation. I just wanna read a couple of the comments that came up as well. Um, Joanne Kelly said that initially people just wanted info and now they're concerned about potential exposure. I think, you know, in the beginning we were like, what is this? And now we're like, oh, it's here, it's here. And maybe, you know, I'm in, I'm in contact with people who have it. Um, and kind of following on that, Carissa McFarland said, I'm concerned about the possible spread when school starts. It was reported a minor upstate was the first reported case in New York state. Um, or reported case in a child. So yeah, there are definitely situations that, you know, as the school year starts and everyone kind of comes back from the summer that we're a little bit more worried about exposure. Um, and then LB, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go back and see what your actual name is, but LB initial said, there isn't much communication about all the different ways 
that it can be contracted, which is concerning. Very little discussion about respiratory transmission and school ventilation systems have not been upgraded in many areas. Um, and especially now with pediatric infection was added by Joanne. So yeah, definitely there's lots of concerns here and hopefully some of this gap in information, um, we'll get some more information um, from Dr. Safo as we go into her presentation. And some of this is just, you know, unfolding as we watch, right? And so we're in this situation again where we're going to have to be vigilant and watch the new information and data as it comes. But as for what we know now, um, uh, Tashi, is it okay if we turn it over to Stella or do you have anything else before we do that? And now without further ado, <laughs> <laughs> the the physician that you are all here to see, Dr. Staffo. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Anu and Tashi. I appreciate um, being here. And I really appreciate the folks who were kind of saying what they're experiencing on the ground. The purpose of us chatting today is just to really provide some information like one-on-one -on -one, and to think about any questions so that you can all go into your communities and share this information. Because, and I think someone said this, it's just really confusing. Should we be concerned? Should we not be concerned? What is it? How is it spread? If I'm not gay, can I get it? Just so many questions that I think um, we haven't been totally clear in explaining. And so my hope today is just to kind of talk through some of this and then really hoping to have a robust conversation around questions that you might still have afterwards. So uh, the promotional materials for this all talked about orthopox viruses. And we're gonna kind of hone in today and talk about monkeypox virus. Orthopox viruses is the kind of family the monkeypox lives in, along with another virus you guys have heard about, which is smallpox. Um, smallpox is an extremely deadly um, virus. And so I'll tell you how that kind of comes into this story, but monkeypox is a less deadly virus. There's a move to decrease the stigma, to decrease the confusion by changing the name. But in this conversation, we would just use monkeypox because it's a bit easier given all the kind of confusion that's going on with everything else. So we're talking about orthopox viruses and we're specifically talking about monkeypox viruses. And we're gonna look at the symptoms and risk factors right away. So you guys know kind of what am I looking for? How does it present? We'll talk about how you prevent yourself from getting sick and some treatment. And then we'll talk about this issue of stigmatizing, especially in black, black and brown communities and how it really plays um, into how people are gonna think of, you know, whether they're at risk for disease. So in terms of the origin and symptoms, I wanna just note, if you remember nothing else, just remember this is not a new disease. And what I mean by that is that we've had cases in West Africa for decades. Um, and so one reminder here is that this is why we care what's happening around the world. Because when we bury our head and we say, oh, we don't have polio here, we don't have monkeypox here, we're good. What happens is we have a global, a global world. And so the conditions that are happening in other places eventually, especially with climate change, will make themselves, will make itself, you know, its way over here. That's why whenever you hear about Ebola in Sub-Saharan Africa, everyone's kind of talking about it because it's just a matter of time before it comes. So monkeypox is not a new disease. It is a disease that is common in some of these, not common, that is, um, that currently is present in some of these other areas, mainly West Africa. This is why we know some of the things that we know about how it's spread and how to treat it, et cetera. It started spreading globally. We had our first case um, in the US May 14, 2022. And it has spread to so many countries at this point that it's, con it's considered um, a global endemic. And it is something, um, excuse me, a global epidemic. It is something that it comes from animals. And the reason why that's important is that when monkeypox first came, we thought that maybe it spread from an animal like a rodent, like a monkey, like rabbits, which um, are the kind of carriers of this virus to a handful of individuals and that as a virus, it wouldn't be super effective in spreading to other people. So sometimes you'll hear about a new disease or a new virus, not new in that we've never seen it, but a virus that comes to us from another place, like for example, Ebola in 2014, it didn't spread very effectively um, for a couple of reasons, but it just didn't spread very effectively. So when monkeypox first hit in May, everyone was kind of like, ooh, monkeypox is here, but should we start vaccinating? What should we do? How should we act? Uh, should we even talk about it that much? And that was because it wasn't clear as a zoonotic virus, it wasn't clear if monkeypox was gonna spread a lot in the community. Give it a month and it started to spread quite a bit. And that's how we're kind of talking about it now. So I wanna say that because that may be why in the beginning, it seemed a little bit confusing and there wasn't a lot of conversation around what was happening and why it was happening. I wanna note again that monkeypox is in this family of orthopox viruses 
with smallpox being one of them. What is smallpox? Smallpox is a disease that um, causes very similar lesions to monkeypox. But the reason why smallpox matters is that it was an extremely deadly disease. If 10 people got smallpox, three of them would die. Didn't matter what you did, didn't matter. Three of them would die. If you think about that number multiplied over a population, you could wipe out 30% of a population with smallpox. So when smallpox was eradicated, meaning there's no more cases of smallpox in the world, smallpox now exists in laboratories. I'm gonna be very careful here. I'm not saying that this is, I'm not saying monkeypox is smallpox and someone released it from a laboratory. I'm saying that smallpox is in the family of monkeypox. Smallpox was gotten rid of and smallpox now only exists in, in certain laboratories where they can study it. The reason why this matters is that if you ever see smallpox in the environment, in the community, it is considered an automatic um, bioterrorism event, meaning that some state, some person released it into, you know, into the world and that's a problem. And this matters because the government has always kind of tried to be protective against what would happen if smallpox was released as a bio, uh, bioterrorism event. So this is why we have those vaccines. There's two types of vaccines that we'll talk about. One of them, um, it's called ACAM2000, is a really severe and not the greatest vaccine. It is not being used now, but the government has stockpiled it because, God forbid, if smallpox is ever released, we have to have enough of this vaccine to protect the population. So I, I tell you this because this is why there's confusion. Is there a vaccine? I thought we had a vaccine. If you were vaccinated for smallpox, does it cover this? All of that confusion comes from this kind of reality of, of the history of smallpox. So with that in mind, let's kind of talk more about monkeypox. 19,000 cases and up as of August 20th. This is probably an underestimation. Not everyone's being diagnosed and we're not getting all the numbers um, from the various countries, but about 19,000 worldwide cases. To keep this in context, there are th 330 million people in the US. And so 19,000 worldwide cases means that your neighbor doesn't have it. Probably you don't really know anyone who has it. It's still a very small number. Again, probably an underestimate, but it's still a small number. And what is it, like, what, how does this present? And so I wanna go through this because this is the question that I get all the time that's really important for us to understand. Many viruses present with what's known as flu-like symptoms, which is just when they've infected your body and your body is like, huh, what is this? And trying to figure it out. So you just don't feel well. So you might feel very tired. You might have a low-grade fever. Your, your body might kind of ache and you might have swollen lymph nodes. Monkeypox is now kind of classically referred to as a, a virus that causes this very distinctive rash. And the rash usually happens a few days after you have your initial symptoms. And we'll kind of talk about what the rash looks like. We are finding in the cases that we have in the US and some of these other Western countries that sometimes you're not getting a whole body rash, which is what we used to see in West Africa, but you're actually getting a rash more in the anal genital region. Why this matters is because someone might look totally fine. You might you know, then have close contact with that part of their body. And if they have lesions there, you will then pick up monkeypox. You can also get it on your, on your, on your torso, on your arms, your legs. And it's a really interesting rash that kind of can be on the, on the palms of your hands and the bottoms of your feet. There's not many rashes in medicine that do that. There's a classic rash with syphilis that does that. So on the hands and feet is one of the ways that we know that it's something different and likely to be monkeypox. However, I just told you that usually you get flu-like symptoms, and then you get the rash. Some people with this kind of worldwide version of monkeypox that we're seeing are only getting the rash. They didn't have any symptoms before, they felt fine, they showed up and they just have the rash. So it's important to kind of know that that can be the case. Now with this question of how do I know if I'm infectious or not infectious, you know that you're past the infected um, phase if the rash has resolved and a new layer of, of skin has grown. It's the rash that is primarily responsible for spreading the infection. You can also spread it if you're talking to someone who has monkeypox and you get some of the droplets on you but you have to be talking pretty close and you have to be um, really like, exposed to it for some time. And so this is important because this is why everyone cares about the rash. And this is why everyone's talking about, is it a sexually transmitted disease? Is it contact? And we'll definitely talk about that. Um, and I guess I wanna note that we'll have time for questions at the end, but just keep putting questions into the chat as we're going along. So I wanna make sure we cover all of this then we can come back and talk. So what are you looking for? Yeah. We just have one question that just popped in. What about the face? Does the rash appear on the face? Absolutely can appear on the face as well. It can be your entire body on the scalp, on the face. Um, we just tend to see it commonly in those areas that I mentioned. And the lesions on the face are very painful because the face has many nerves, nerves and blood flow. So lesions can be really, really painful. Thank you. Of course.
So the picture that you're seeing on the left, um, and there's a real move to stop using pictures that are like pictures of Black people with monkeypox, especially Black people from Africa with monkeypox, because it it's one, creates this idea that it's only those individuals, and two, it's not really representative of what we're seeing here. So I'm showing you the classic picture of what monkeypox lesions look like in certain resource poor um, settings, right? And here the lesions are big, they're water filled. I don't know about you, but I've, I've never seen lesions like this before, right? If you think that this is what it's going to look like, you may have trouble actually diagnosing it because what monkeypox is looking like more when we actually see it um, in our environment, it, it can actually look like, an, a, like a, a dermatitis. It can look like acne. I had a patient who I thought, is this acne? Is this monkeypox? It can look like a condition called molluscum. And there's something, um, a medical term called umbilicated, which is just when you dip down and then you have like the edges come up. So kind of like a divot inside the lesion, which is what this one here looks like, the one on the very right. So it can, it can have many different appearances, which is why you have to have a high suspicion. And then we can know that it's monkeypox by swabbing the actual rash, rash itself and sending it off to the um, laboratory for them to evaluate. But what I want you to take away from this is that yes, the left, you know, on, on the kind of left, the darker skin picture, that's what people think monkeypox looks like. Cause that's what we've learned in you know medical school. This is what it is. Um, but in actuality, the monkeypox that we're seeing now is a little bit harder in terms of the rash to figure out. So the person who said she was called to the park to say, is this monkeypox or not? I think it's really wise that you didn't go because we don't know. We don't know just from looking at the rash. Oh, for sure. This is monkeypox. And so one of the kind of important things that we're seeing is that monkeypox can actually present, present like other diseases and other infections. When I see patients, I, I work in um, um, an HIV clinic and I see patients who may also be coming in with other sexually transmitted infections, especially something like syphilis. So again, this is why if you go in for testing, you want to say, I think I have monkeypox because someone that I know had monkeypox. Otherwise, you may just be evaluated for some of these other things. So other things like pox viruses. Um, or other just even allergic or just basic kind of non-infectious skin conditions like a dermatitis. So a quick word on pox viruses. People have said, is chicken pox the same as monkey pox? No, there is a, a family of viruses known as pox viruses that include a couple of different things. Smallpox is in there um, as an orthopox virus. Uh, uh, variola and varicella viruses are in there. Not really important, but just to say that there's many pox-based viruses that fall into this category. And the reason why they're all in the same category is because of um, something around their viral DNA. So monkeypox can be like other conditions. If you have a rash, it can be something else, which is good news. And those are some of the things that it can be. So what do we know about severe disease, right? Because even like with COVID, everyone can get infected, but not everyone's gonna be super sick. Who is at risk for being super sick? So it's the usual, it's folks who have other comorbid conditions especially those who have a compromised immune system. And we have found that severe disease tends to happen in resource poor settings. I hate that term, but it kind of lets you know what you're, what you're thinking about. And the reason there is because they don't have some of the conservative, um, uh, they don't have some of the access to healthcare resources to support. So that's why we have this uh, data point that yes, we have many thousands of cases of monkeypox. We have over 2,700 in New York alone, but we haven't had any deaths yet because uh, it is the kind of virus that really tends to kill people if they're in resource poor settings or you know, suffering other kind of comorbid conditions that make it really, really severe. Um, the complications that can arise really depends on the site. And so if you have monkeypox, that question is, can it be on your face? Absolutely. And especially if it starts to go towards your eyes, that's considered a medical emergency. If there's a reason that we're worried that you have severe disease and we can't just manage the symptoms. So the managing the symptoms is giving you pain medicines, giving you Tylenol for your fever, kind of just you know baseline things that we would do for any kind of a flu-like illness, right? If we can't manage your symptoms and we think, oh my God, this person has monkeypox that includes the eyes, or this person has rash all over their body that's so severe, or you know this person's immune compromised, we can give you a medicine called tocoviramat there's also two other anti, well, there's one other antiviral agent that isn't really being used now, but is available. Um, and there's also, um, there's two other treatments that we can use, less important for this group, um, apart from T-pox. So T-pox is a name that you're going to hear. Same thing as tocoviramat. That's what's given to people. It can be given as an outpatient or it can be given in the hospital. I want to say here, whenever I talk about treatments and vaccines, I kind of want to just be really honest. So I told you the story of the vaccines and how we got the vaccines. They were originally for smallpox. We can use them for monkeypox. We're only using one brand, the one that's super safe. 
The story of what's happening with tocoviramide is really interesting, which is that it is a um, medication that was created again to treat smallpox and monkeypox, but it hasn't been studied in the way that we have studied other um, um, drugs that have come to market. And that's in part because normally we like to study these, these drugs in a ton of people who have the disease. Honestly, we haven't had a lot of people with the disease until now. So in order to get to Gaviramat, and this is important for you to know, your doctor or your clinic has to fill out a ton of paperwork to get it released from the government in order to use it. That matters because if you don't, if one, if you don't have access to a healthcare you know, place, you can't just call up and say, oh, I need this. You really wanna to go to the right center to be able to access it. And it may take some time. So if you think that you have monkeypox, you think you might have a severe outcome, you wanna access it early because again, because it's not the kind of classic medicine that we use, it can take some time. About 10% of people who are infected end up in the hospital. And again, no deaths just yet. I'll pause for a quick moment, see if there's any questions. And again, we'll take questions at the end, but so let's talk about the prevention. We talked about treatment a little bit. The reason why we care about this is because right now we are being hit in the US. Um, we have thousands of cases in the US with 2,700 cases in New York alone. Um, and I wanna just say this and be really clear about this because this is like the thing that's creating the most confusion. So a sexually transmitted disease, the way that we think about it is a, is a disease that's primarily transmitted through sexual means, through semen or vaginal fluid. And so this is why we tend to talk about things like chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, et cetera, right? Um, monkeypox virus is an interesting one because technically monkeypox virus is a contact-based disease, which means that if I'm sitting next to someone who has monkeypox um, disease and I my, my arm is touching their arm and they have a rash on their arm, right? And I sit there for who knows, 15, 20, 30 minutes. I will walk away and I could then get monkeypox from them. I didn't have sex with them. I didn't exchange fluids with them per se, but it was contact that happened between us. And then I got it. And this is really important because it lets us know that everyone is at risk. It doesn't mean that we're all getting it. It just means that everyone is at risk, which is why we're really talking about the importance if you do have monkeypox of isolating or at least covering your lesions so that you can decrease the spread. So monkeypox is a contact-based disease, but it's really effectively spread through sex. Why? Because what happens in sex? There's a lot of contact for a sustained amount of time. And the reason why we're seeing it over 90% of cases, I think in some areas, it's over 97% of cases in men who have sex with men is because um, when you have a disease that starts to increase in a certain population, and then that population is always kind of with each other, you can end up having a, a really high number within that population, right? You can imagine if someone lives in a house and has a, you know, a certain condition and then spreads it to the 100 people in that house, you're going to see higher numbers among the folks there than let's say you would in the general community. So right now we're having kind of group contained spread that's happening primarily through sex primarily among, among men who have sex with men. There is the concern because it is contact-based that when we send kids back to school in the fall, that we may end up seeing more monkeypox cases among juveniles. We have now, I think five cases in California, seven in Texas. We have quite a few less than 18 uh, monkeypox virus cases. Um, again, not necessarily through sexual contact, but through spread, because if I'm someone who lives in the home with someone um, who may have it, I may get it through that kind of, um, through, through that skin to skin um, contact that spreads it. It's skin to skin and it's also bedding, towels. And we know this from the cases in West Africa where we saw that people maybe didn't necessarily touch the skin, but clean the bedding, change the sheets, slept in the bed, and then got monkeypox that way. Let me just pause to see if there's questions because this is a really important point. Yeah, there's one question here, Stella, right now from Juliet. Are clients on at-home quarantine or hospital quarantine during their infectious period? That's a great question. So they are at at-home quarantine. If you're in the hospital because you're super sick, they'll put you in a special room and they'll note, you know, that folks should be careful going in and out. But monkeypox is for as bad and as severe as the lesions can be. Most people who have monkeypox um, can be treated as an outpatient. And so they, we just ask them to isolate at home and then to tell us anyone else that they've been exposed to so we can make sure that they isolate before they get sick. But that's a great question. You're not being forced to go into the hospital or go somewhere to you know, avoid spread. We're just asking you to stay home. But 
You're being asked to stay home for up to 21 days in some cases, because that's how long it takes for the skin to go through the rash and to kind of reform the new layer of skin so you're not infectious anymore. That has huge implications for work, for school. Um, and so this is why there's a conversation now of what happens if we get more monkeypox cases? How are employers going to be fair to people who have these, you know, who, who might be sick so that we don't end up in a situation where people are forced to go to work and, and you know, are forced to then spread it? Thank you, Stella. Is there anyone else? If you've got a question right now, put your hand up and we'll circle back to you or just drop it in the comment box. But right now, that seems to be it. Awesome. So um, uh, just a kind of another focus, I want to kind of just give you some key ideas around prevention and treatment because I think it makes it really easy, right? Prevention, the number one way, since we know it's spread by contact, is to really avoid contact with um, individuals with proven monkeypox or with the materials that they might be using. So materials, I mean bedding, sheets, clothing, um, and that's kind of the first step. Again, in a in a you know in a in a city with millions of people, we only have about two thousand cases. That's probably an underestimate, but that means that we're not encountering it a ton. So when monkeypox was first kind of being um, dealt with in the city, I had this question of like, what's going to happen on the trains? Because a ton of people sit on the trains, they sit with kind of, you know, their bare skin, they're in the chairs, moving around. And um, the good news is that even though the virus that causes, you know, the monkeypox um, virus itself can kind of survive on surfaces as fomites, that's what they call the, the kind of um, part particles on surfaces, it isn't an effective way of spread, it seems, from surface to surface. So, Otherwise, we would be seeing a lot more spread through things like public transportation, through things like grocery stores and you touch the doors or whatever. And the reason is because I think it's due to the amount of virus that you're exposed to probably, probably isn't that much. And it's due to the fact that you have to be in contact with it for a long period of time. I will say for those who live in big cities, if the numbers start to go up a lot, and if, you, if your morning commute is anything like mine where you have a ton of people jammed in, out of an abundance of caution, it may make sense to wear longer sleeves when you're in public transport. I'm not saying it to be alarmist. I'm not saying, but I just, I tell you what I would do in that case, um, based on the reality that people have it, they may not know. And how many of us have been on a packed subway where we're just jammed up against each other and there's kind of nowhere to go. Again, if someone has active rash lesions that's touching you, there is a chance. If you have it, you want to isolate. And that's important because it will prevent the spread. Um, and um, oh, sorry, this is for prevention. So if someone tells you I have monkeypox and we spent some time together, you really want to um, make sure that you, you, you are kind of watching yourself for a good two weeks because you can develop it in any time in that period. If you um, know that you've been exposed, the city, at least here in New York, is offering you, um, is offering you a vaccine to prevent you from actually uh, getting sick. So if you've been exposed, you're not sure yet if you have it, but you've been exposed within the first four days, especially, you can go ahead and get a vaccine. There's a question that people have, and there's probably healthcare workers on this call. If I'm a healthcare worker, am I going to get it? How do I keep myself safe? Can I get a vaccine? Right now, because of the way that it's spreading, they're not suggesting that healthcare workers get a vaccine. And that's in part because when we walk in, when, we, when I see you know patients who potentially have monkeypox, I gown up fully. I have the, the, the hair, the, the facial, everything so that the contact is so minimal that the few doses of vaccines that we have, we wanna give it to people who are more at risk. And then once, and if God forbid, it gets to the point where many people, many kids, many you know, um, non at risk group, you know, groups start to become at risk, then we start to think about kind of population level vaccinations, which is challenging because we don't have enough vaccines. And so let us all hope that the manufacturers start to make those more. If you are infected and you are sick, you want to see a healthcare provider. You want to get diagnosed. You want to get medicines to make you feel better, like pain medicines, you know, things for the rash, which can be very painful. And you want to um, then see if you're eligible, you know, either to be hospitalized if the monkeypox virus is in a bad place or to get T-pox. I want to note here, I don't know if someone said it already, but there have been people, yeah, I think someone said it, people who have not gotten diagnosed for a while because clinicians haven't been thinking about this. You should go ahead and not worry about this thing, but not worry about whatever and say, I am afraid I have monkeypox. Name that that is the concern because clinicians may not be thinking about it as front of mind and you should keep pushing and pushing and pushing until you can really have that addressed. 
I want to note again that the, you know, if you tell someone you have monkeypox, you get diagnosed with it and you're asked to stay at home and isolate and you don't get any medicine, it isn't because you're not being treated well. It's more because this disease really just requires us to treat your symptoms and then to kind of, you know, monitor you from there. Dr. Safo, thank you so much. We have a couple of questions. Is now a good time? Yeah. Okay. So the first one is, can someone who is exposed get a vaccine, even if they are not LGBTQ plus? Yes. We have a couple of cases where people have been in a family um, and have been exposed and they're able to get a vaccine. It is very difficult, but yes, you can get, it's, that's, this is why it matters that people are, are getting diagnosed. Because if you can say my you know, family member has been diagnosed with monkeypox, now I need the vaccine. It's easier than if you say, I think they have monkeypox, they have a rash, you wouldn't be able to get it that way. Great, thank you. Um, another question, how long can the virus live on surfaces? What do we know about that? That's really a fascinating question. I've been reading a lot about that. It seems like it can live on surfaces for quite a few months. So for example, HIV, which you know, I think many of us know well, dies within a few hours. Monkeypox is interesting because it can live for a few months. And if the droplets are really encapsulated, um, there have been some estimates that it can be there even for a few years, which is terrifying. But again, you won't get infected if there's not enough of it. And so if there's just a little droplet and you touch it, there's no reason why we would think that that would convert. All of what I'm saying though, is what we know to date. Viruses change over time. And so who knows how that might change going forward. The other thing about that question that's interesting is that the usual things like you know um, sanitizers and whatnot that we use to clean surfaces sometimes, some of them are not totally effective against monkeypox. You actually need like a certain uh, grade of cleaner to really clean it. So like bleach seems to work, but some of the other like Lysol and whatnot may not actually work. So it's a simple Google search. Just look up like what cleaning agents are effective against monkeypox. If you are, let's say a daycare worker and you have lots of people on, you know, touching certain services and you want to clean it, just know that not all the usual cleaning things that we use are effective against monkeypox. That is super useful. Thank you so much. Um, Another question, if you get monkeypox and overcome the virus, does your body build up immunity to the virus? Yes, it does. And so you will have immunity. Monkeypox, you know, COVID has scarred us so much that we don't even know how to talk about, you know, any of these viruses. Um, monkeypox seems to be, though, that if you, if you get it and you form that kind of natural immunity, you shouldn't get reinfected again. It also seems like because, and I'll tell you, you know, what's happening with the vaccines. It seems like if you get one dose of the two dose vaccine series, after a few weeks, usually about two to three weeks, you should have protection even then. So it isn't the kind of virus right now that can just like really mess with you super hard, even if you've had it before. And if you're vaccinated, it seems like the vaccines are seeming to work. Again, that's as of today. There's a lot of anecdotal cases that I've heard of. I got vaccinated and it didn't, you know, it didn't work. That's usually for people who got vaccinated, but didn't give their body enough time to build immunity and had an exposure before their body built immunity. Does that answer the question? I hope that answers the question. Let me know if it doesn't. That's great, thank you. And, and definitely we'll have time for a Q&A after this. So if we need clarification, we can come back to you. The last question, and then we'll let you um, continue for now, is when you get shingles, they have medications that can help with the pain of the blisters. Will that help here? Yeah, it's very similar medicine. It's gabapentin. It's We actually are using something called lidocaine, the lidocaine cream on the lesions. Um, I haven't seen, but I haven't seen a ton of monkeypox folks after they've healed. Part of the reason why shingles is hard is because shingles gets into the nerves and it's very painful even after it passes. So we give you some medicines that target the nerves. I think with the monkeypox lesions, when people have them, it's really painful. But once it once it heals over, they're not, they're not still having like the kind of triggering nerve pain. Um, but during that, you'll get, you know, creams and other things that will definitely help your, your, help your symptoms. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to let you continue. And then for those of you who are dropping questions into the chat, um, please go ahead and keep doing that. And we'll be collecting them and we'll pile them into the Q&A at the end of the session. So there's an interesting thing about vaccinations. I told you guys the story of what, you know, how smallpox um, impacted all of this. We're using the vaccine right now, Genios. They don't have enough of it. They're trying to manufacture more of it. It is coming through from most places, the public health bodies. So the New York Department of Public Health 
um, is sending it out to some clinics or they're having their own standalone vaccination areas. In most places around the country, it will come through your public health body and they will vaccinate at their central sites. The good news is that COVID has taught us how to do mass vaccination. So they're using a lot of those same principles. Um, right now, at least in New York and in most places, the recommendation is for men who have sex with men, sorry that there's a typo there, but for men who have sex with men, and um, the idea with it is actually that they're targeting as first priority uh, individuals who have had two or more partners um, in the last year, with the idea being that you're more likely to have sexual contact with someone, and so you should be kind of first up. I have seen, you know, folks who are just like, I'm in this category of men who have sex with men, it's contact spread. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the vaccine and they're giving the vaccines that way. We don't have enough vaccines. And so there's an issue of equity, which, you know, um, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but a lot of what we saw is we saw a lot of predominantly white, wealthy individuals rushing the vaccine sites. Why? Because when, when New York City would release the vaccine appointments, people were just sitting at their computers, just typing in and just getting all the appointments. If you worked, if you were not computer savvy, if you, for any, you know, any number of reasons that are around access issues, if you couldn't get those appointments, you weren't going to be able to get the vaccine. And it was so bad that when they opened up sites in Harlem and, and, and Brooklyn, we saw folks from Chelsea, other predominantly white um, neighborhoods signing up for those appointments and going up to Harlem, going to Brooklyn and taking those appointments. It matters because we saw from one study in Georgia that of the uh, men who had sex with men who had monkeypox, I think over 80% of them were um, Black and um, Latinx. And so we're probably going to see similar numbers in the breakdowns. You know, there's an interesting graphic um, that's coming out right now of the individuals who have been vaccinated for uh, monkeypox in, in New York and uh, among men with sex with men. And it's predominantly or very, very high representation of um, white New Yorkers. So the equity issue matters, which is why it's so important that we're in conversation here, because if you know someone who is in this group, you know, who could get vaccinated, they should access these vaccines as soon as they can, um, because we keep running out, but also because it's important that we, we get folks vaccinated and protected as soon as we can. And because the vaccines are running out, every time we get a shipment, the, the appointments go pretty fast, but you can get in there and get an appointment. What they're going to do now to extend the vaccine is they're actually going to make it into um, smaller uh, doses. So one vial or one dose that would have been just one dose that went deep into your arm will now be placed at the surface of your skin. And that's because there is a study that seemed to show that um, even just a small amount of that vaccine can be effective. It sucks that we have to do this. I dislike this so much because I prefer that we can give the vaccines and like certify for sure that we can keep folks safe. And I'm sure there's gonna be some breakthrough cases with this. Um, however, this is the best that we can do most likely given the resources that we have. Um, and again, this is why it was upsetting that we lost that month of May, you know, talking about, we don't know if it's gonna spread. Will it spread, will it not spread? We could have used that time to make more vaccines. And unfortunately now we're playing catch up and having to really share the doses. Questions here. I think you may have answered this one with the slide, but just to be clear, um, the last question that came in was, if you were vaccinated against smallpox, um, will that be effective against monkeypox? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that way. And in part, it's because um, those, those vaccines for folks who got them was really, really remote. And so um, it doesn't seem like the cross coverage will necessarily last. So right now the recommendation, you know, if that was the case, the recommendation would be men who have sex with men with a number of partners, um, who haven't had a smallpox vaccine. Right now, the recommendation is just, let's just not make any assumptions. Let's just get everyone who's in that risk group vaccinated. So that's a really, really good question, but it doesn't seem like there's that cross coverage. Thank you. Another question. Um, is there, if you think you have it, is there a number you call or do you just go to the hospital emergency room exposing others on the way? It's a great question. So if you think you have it, um, you want to kind of think about who, who, where you may have gotten it from, because part of what will help you to get treatment and get, you know, correctly evaluated is being able to kind of tell your story, you know, so I was um, exposed to someone who had monkeypox or I was, I had a new sexual partner, whatever it is, just to be able to go to get health, you know, to get like healthcare that's going to be the most effective. Part of what I'm seeing is people coming in thinking that they have it and they can't really talk about what the exposure was. 
you're less likely in that case to get appropriately treated. When you go, you want to go with all of your lesions covered. So when someone comes to our clinic right now and they may have monkeypox, um, and let's say they came in wearing shorts and a t-shirt, we will put band-aids on all of their lesions just to make sure that when they're going, and we tell them, you know, get into a car, don't go on the subway, um, wear a mask, right? Another reason to wear a mask um, that so that like, they're not infectious. So if you're going to get healthcare, which is fine, try to cover all of your lesions just to make sure that you're not spreading it um, if you can. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question, are those who have conditions like eczema where skin may be broken at greater risk as it relates to surfaces fomites? Um, That's an excellent question. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, there's a second part to which, which is if I'm um, also wondering if there are any efforts to do education or outreach in prisons or nursing homes, um, perhaps there are differences based on location. So there's a call right now to really be mindful of giving vaccines in prisons. So right now, as I mentioned to you, it's just going to men who have sex with men when in prisons, regardless of kind of sexual status, risk group, whatever, the quarters are so close. Um, sex is often exchanged as part of like transactions to just stay safe that folks are really high risk for spread. And so there's an idea because again, folks are just kind of um, packed in with each other to just vaccinate prisons you know, um, now before we start to see the spread. Nursing homes, we've had less of those conversations, um, but any space where it, let's say monkeypox has spread and there's potential for continued contact, it definitely becomes a concern of how do we vaccinate people to keep them safe? Everything we're talking about here, I guarantee you in two weeks, in two months, the conversation will kind of um, be modified slightly as we get more information. It may be that we might get into the fall where kids are back in school and monkeypox actually doesn't spread very effect effectively among the pediatric population or doesn't spread very effectively, even if it's in you know, um, nursing homes or jails. We just don't know, but we are thinking ahead that this could be the case. And then for the first question of the eczema with the fomites, it's, it's an excellent point. The way that you get a virus is if your skin or if the area, if you, if you break down the barrier of your body so the virus can come in. This is why with HIV, people who have chlamydia, gonorrhea, or herpes are more likely to get to convert to HIV when they're exposed to it because the skin is broken down, you can get more virus in. So technically, I think if you have open, weepy, you know, eczema lesions and you are putting yourself, you know, let's say on public transportation where someone has just sat and also had open lesions from the monkeypox rash and has like an area where it, it's on and then you put your skin on there, absolutely theoretically, you could totally get it that way. Um, we can't do those studies. We can't do those like real world studies, but I'm sure as the numbers increase, we're gonna hear of some folks who have the risk factor of more open skin lesions talking about, oh, I, I never had any sexual contact. I never met anyone with monkeypox. All I did was go on a cruise and then somehow I got it, you know? And so we'll probably see more, more examples of that. Great, thank you. And we have someone with their hand up. So maybe we'll do this, um, answer this question and then keep going. Sure. Um, Tafre, I'm sorry, I hope I'm saying your name right. Yes, no, it's Kafri. Uh, I'll offer you a piece. I, I wanted to go back to your point about equity, but also mention language. Um, I live in Georgia and the, the stats that you shared about about the prevalence of, of monkeypox is among Black and Latinx men. Um, the, the, the equity comes in where, where it, it's twofold. The equity comes in with language. And mm -hmm. if the language is, the language that the, the medical community is using is MSM, that doesn't translate to the street. And, 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 it, and it really doesn't translate to the street. And, and so, Many people are using gay man as the language, but it's to the exclusion of bisexual man, which I am one. <clears throat> and when I went to get <clears throat> a monkeypox vaccine at where I received care for HIV, I have been there for 13 years, I had to disclose being a bisexual several times um, before I was able to get the monkeypox vaccine. And and it was it was out of line, it was out of order, and and it shouldn't happen. But but it only I only got the vaccine because I advocate for myself. And I can imagine any number of other people who stepped up to that same desk to ask for a monkeypox vaccine and were turned away. That is so powerful. Can I respond to that quickly, please? Um, 
That is so powerful, A. B, I welcome kind of any updates on language. One of the things that I found is challenging when you talk about um, kind of who's at risk is that if you say gay men, folks who don't consider themselves gay will be like, that's not me. If you say bisexual um, men, folks who don't consider themselves bisexual will say that that's not me. And so there is a real kind of precision that we want to get to with the language. And so like, I definitely um, love, this is why it's just, it's an honor to be in conversation with folks who are like living this and experiencing this for real, because if there are more inclusive terms, better terms, more appropriate terms, we need to know we need to be using them. Um, I have found that describing the trans, the kind of mechanism of transmission to be the thing that's kind of most effective. So the folks are like, I don't consider myself gay, but I do have sex with men. Okay. All right. And then to your point of just the way that you have to disclose, it is shameful, to be honest with you, that we in the healthcare kind of community can't get our, our stuff together to be um, more, more just overall inclusive in the way that we roll out these things. I mean, the people who are walking up to, um, you know, different health facilities and having to just put their entire business out there in a way that doesn't really, you know, address um, the sensitivities, you know, like doesn't address the fact that we need just a, a baseline of trauma-informed care and just more appropriate care than I think we tend to have in the healthcare system. And it's in part, you know, this is not at all an excuse, but I just want to contextualize it. It's in part because people are not comfortable with these issues. They're not comfortable with these topics. Um, and also because right now, the way that these things are working out is it's a checklist. You know, when, when COVID first came, it used to be the checklist was, has this person traveled to Asia? Have they traveled to China? check or not, then they have COVID, right? Now it's a checklist of, does this person have sex with men? Check or not, then they can get the vaccine. So it's a little limited, but it's it's the way that we are able to operationalize, giving out a very kind of narrow resource. I love what you said about advocacy. It is the most important thing um, because the healthcare system will try you and uh, it will often fail many of us. And so being able to be very kind of, um, front-footed about advocating for yourself is incredibly important. So I won't say more about that, but I just, I really, I really appreciate those comments. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your questions and thank you, Dr. Sapo. And I'm, I'm gonna let you continue because I know there's more coming um, and we'll have time for some more Q&A at the end. Thank you. Okay. So just this last portion, I think um, the kind of take home that I wanna give for us is that we're all at risk. If we had enough vaccines, what I would say for us to really think about the approach to monkeypox would be let's all get vaccinated. Um, because it technically can impact any and, and all of us. Right now, to the, the point that someone made about how it seems like every day we have a new pathogen or a new disease that we're fighting. Right now, polio is making a comeback. And polio is one of those things where right now, we only have one case of it really that we're seeing in someone who's unvaccinated. And the recommendation is that everyone gets vaccinated. Why? Because we have enough vaccine. We know the vaccine is safe. And all of us are at risk for polio, which is a disease that spreads um, through the oral fecal route. If we had enough vaccine, I would say, let's all go ahead and get the vaccine, but we don't because we can't have nice things. Um, but it's important for us to remember that we are all indeed at risk. And so the stigma around monkeypox is something that's gonna impact all of us. And I just wanna read you this um, comment from an international pa panel of scientists. You can see their names listed here. Um, they said, as with any other disease, monkeypox um, disease can occur in any region of the world. It can afflict anyone regardless of race or ethnicity. As such, we believe that no race or skin complexion should be the face of this disease. Um, and, and this was really in conversation around the reality that most people, again, are using images of, you know, folks from Sub-Saharan Africa to talk about monkeypox, or they're referring to it as a disease, God forbid, that only really is impacting certain racial and ethnic groups, which is not true. And so there's a real move to think about how do we, how do we mess ourselves up when we kind of restrict monkeypox to only a certain group of individuals, understanding that it's a contact-based based disease and any of us can truly um, be at risk. So with this idea that we are all at risk, I have said to my patients over and over, this isn't a gay man disease. It's the same mistake that we made with HIV. For years with HIV, we said it was a gay man disease. And what happened? When heterosexual individuals, heterosexual women in particular started getting it, we were slow to diagnose them. We were slow to treat them. So we have to be on um, we have to just be ready, right? And so if we start seeing that we're getting this in, you know, older individuals in nursing homes, like was suggested, or in kids, we can't be like, oh my goodness, howsoever did they get monkeypox? We understand the mechanism of transmission just because we call it, you know, a gay disease doesn't make it so, it can still spread. And so I think that that's just an important point to make. I don't consider monkeypox a sexually transmitted infection. 
It is most effectively spread right now through sex. However, it can be spread through contact, um, non-sex-based contact, so that's important. Even though that is the case, we're all at risk, it's not an STI, it is important that we focus our prevention efforts on at-risk groups in particular. Why? Because this is where we're seeing the most cases. So if we can help folks in these groups contain the virus, it's, it's a benefit for all of us. Right now, we're seeing it primarily in our LGBTQ plus population. Um, and so we're focusing our efforts there. But again, you know, it can at any, any point become much more um, prevalent among the kind of general quote unquote population. It is a public health emergency and has been declared as so by the WHO, New York City, and a couple of other jurisdictions. And then the US recently declared it public health emergency. And what this means really is that they're going to put more treatments, more um, lab diagnostics, just basically more money around it. It doesn't mean that monkeypox is like rising super fast and everyone's gonna get it and we have to go shut down and have mandates. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that it is rising enough that it could be a real problem. And so we need to put more resources to treat and diagnose it. And that's that's what these public health emergencies really mean. So if you think that you have monkeypox, it's important as um, one of our colleagues just said, you wanna advocate. You wanna advocate to get it tested. And if it's severe, you wanna advocate to get T-pox. How you do this is getting in touch with your primary care, urgent care, or your public health offices. If you don't have a primary care office, you want to get in touch with your public health office. They will send you to urgent care, but at least you're able to start getting those kind of services ready. Cover your lesions if you're going out and you think you have monkeypox. You want to isolate once you do know that you have it, um, or actually while you're waiting to get confirmed, you want to isolate. Why? Because if you keep you know, being around people, you can just keep spreading it. And what's going to happen once you get diagnosed is they're going to ask you, who have your contacts been? And a lot of these public health offices will reach out and they'll just let them know, hey, you might have been exposed to monkeypox, you know, um, come in and get the vaccine and just watch out for symptoms. Again, once you're isolating, you want to cover your lesions and you want to wear a mask because monkeypox can spread through droplets. Even if you can't get diagnosed, even if you can't get the kind of official you know, word on this, you do wanna to try to tell your, your primary care um, doctor in your public health office that you suspect that you have monkeypox. There are some public health offices and certainly primary care offices that are collecting these data to be able to get you help and other resources down the line. Um, and even if that doesn't happen, it can also help with thinking about contact tracing. Us getting, getting to know who has it and who's been exposed is the way that we can contain this. And so that's one of the things that I would mention um, if you think you have monkeypox. And so just some key takeaways, it's a contact-based disease, simple precautions like isolation, hand washing, using protective equipment um, or using protective kind of covering and layering of clothing can help. Vaccinations are really important, especially if you're in one of those groups that's considered to be more at risk to get sick. And if you think that you are infected, you wanna really talk to your doctor, talk to your public health office. You wanna know that you can get, so just so you can know you can get tested and also so you can know that you can get T-pox if you need it. And I wanna acknowledge that, that might take some advocating, but it is important. These are some of the references. Um, the CDC always has good stuff. There's a really interesting infographic um, that a um, colleague from Twitter has shared. So you can feel free to access that. And then the kind of, official academic paper on monkeypox comes from the New England Journal of Medicine. And you guys, um, I left the link there. And this is just how you can get to us at Just Equity for Health. Um, and I'm going to stop screen sharing and turn it over to Dr. Anu for questions. Great, that was incredible. I feel like you just gave us a huge wealth of knowledge in such a short amount of time. Um, we just got a comment, this is super informative. I have to agree, it's so great just to be given the information we need in such a succinct and like really understandable way. Thank you so much. Um, questions. I don't have anything in the comments right now for unanswered questions, um, but feel free to raise your hand, feel free to rate, to drop comments into the, into the chat box. Um, and while we're waiting, I'm just gonna to start it off with a question that I was asked recently, which was, you know, we live in a city, we live in a very crowded city, we share a lot of public utilities, including laundromats. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what are our risks from washing our laundry in machines that are used by a lot of folks? Interesting question. There is um, 
there is like a, a little bit of research being done around whether monkeypox will be killed within standard washing machines because the heat should kill most um, pathogens. It seems like there was one one report that it doesn't necessarily die at a certain at the heat level that we use to wash clothes. You need a couple of tens of degrees higher um, to to kill it. So I want to just say that theoretically. Let us say that someone who has monkeypox disease really, you know, intensely and is shed into bedcloths goes and washes their clothes in a um, public washing facility. Um, and then you wash it there and, and then you put on your clothes. Could you theoretically get it that way? Yes, theoretically. I do not think that, that is currently an effective way to get it. The reason why I say that is because when monkeypox was kind of spreading, there was this real question of like, if you live in a city like New York City, and you have all of these different ways that we are all in, in connection with each other, that we all touch each other, that we all share facilities, will we see these type of community spread happening pretty early on? We've had monkeypox since May, and we haven't heard even anecdotally any of these types of, um, of forms of spread. One interesting form that I heard was a woman in Georgia who um, wasn't at risk in any other way, but that she worked at a gas station and was touching money. Um, which is with her bare hands, that she developed monkeypox. And her theory is that she might have gotten it off of the money. I've been keeping an ear out for a lot of these cases of kind of non-traditional spread, just because I'm interested in this question of like, exactly as you said, can you get it from the laundry? Can you get, you know? And I would say that theoretically, yes. Practically, no. Because if that was the way that you could get it, we should probably be seeing it at this point. This could change if we get many, much higher numbers of those who are infected, right? So if you start to talk about hundreds of thousands of people that may have it, then it may actually, then we may actually start to have a different situation because maybe you washed your, you know, your clothes in a washing machine that was used by three people who had monkeypox virus. And now that washing machine is full of, you know, the particulate, and then you get it that way. Maybe, again, I don't think it's going to be that, but I always want to just caveat that this is what we know now, today, right now. It can change because things always change, but I think that's a really, really good idea that we have, and I don't think that it's going to spread that way. Great, thank you. Um, and now I don't see anyone else's hands up right now. Tashi, did you, I have a couple of other questions lined up here, but Go ahead. I just want to uh, to add when we were coming up with the um, when we were talking about this topic, um, I knew myself and, and Janine. We were um, a couple of things that I brought to them, and it's interesting that you mentioned the subway because that's one thing that I said. Um, I had even just you know I study people in general. So when I was on the when I was on the subway, like you said, usually we're in there, we're like we're packed in there like sardines, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Subway is very forgiving, forgiving because everyone has somewhere to be. So we're all, you know, and I noticed that people were making themselves smaller, right? Mm. To avoid that contact. Um, you know, we, I'm used to seeing people like with gloves on or, you know, like holding a pole with, with a paper towel or something like that. I'm seeing that happen a lot more now. And people just really being super cognizant, like maybe not sitting all the way back when they get a seat. They're just kind of like, you know, up. Um, forward. And also, honestly, I study people enough to really recognize the fear in a lot of their eyes because people don't know what's going on. They're not sure what's happening. They know that their livelihood depends on them going to work, traveling, being around other people. Um, it's challenging. I've seen people with um, skin issues and I can't, you know, I'm obviously I'm not a physician. I can't identify that as being monkeypox, but, you know, I've seen how people look at folks and it may mm. not be monkeypox, you know, um, but they're aware and they're like, wait a minute, if it is, why do they have one shorts? Why do they have one short sleeves? And we don't know. And so, you know, like to think of these biases that we have now, mm. um, with everything going on. And another thing that I noticed is with having the conversation with peers, um, a lot of people seem to be more willing, right, to get the monkeypox um, virus vaccine than they were initially with COVID. And I'm thinking that's interesting, right? Because we're not seeing like fatalities from this, right? People were literally dropping dead from COVID at like alarming rates. I remember even early in, in March and April of 2020, and every time you turn like several th thousands of people, you know, were dying. And now though, that you see the lesions, right? On your face, it may look like an S. 
STI or, you know, whatever people are like, Mm-mm. you know, I don't want that. And so they're like, sign me up for the vaccines. Where can we get them? Mm-hmm. Um, I did want to know, um, and I'm not, and forgive me if you, if you touched on this, but as it relates to children, you know, children, they were the last ones to have access to the vaccines with COVID. Do you think that this is something that um, will be the same? And I know that, you know, monkeypox virus is not new, but do you think that children will have access um, to the vaccine? And also would it be, um, would there be an um, an age range Mm -hmm. um, in in that regard? And um, there's another question. I I know I'm talking a lot. I want other people to be able to talk to you. You have such good questions. (laughs) Thank you. So your comments, I think, are really brilliant ones. I get at an aspect of stigma that I didn't address, which um, a few weeks ago, someone from, it was New York, someone took a picture of a young woman who has a condition called neurofibromatosis, where you get little tiny tumors underneath your skin. And they were like, she has monkeypox and she's on the subway, F her, you know, that kind of thing. And this young woman saw herself trending on social media and actually had a response post that was like, no, I don't have monkeypox. I have neurofibromatosis, have some freaking empathy, right? So I think that that point that you make about how people are looking at each other is important for us. This is why it matters so much that people kind of do the right thing if they do have monkeypox, because then it can kind of create a sense of public trust in each other that if you had monkeypox, you wouldn't be out there with your shorts and no mask, you know? Um, But it, it, it reminds us to really have empathy for each other right? That there are people who are suffering from all kinds of things. I saw a person the other day, I thought it was just acne on their back, but in my mind, I guess, because I'm seeing and thinking a lot about monkeypox, I was like, huh, I wonder if it's monkeypox, but I never had that thought, you know, um, a while ago. And who among us doesn't have like back scar from acne, right? And so like, when you start to think about just the potential to start to stigmatize people based on visual aspects, it's really concerning and it's scary. And I just, I, I want all of us to have empathy as we're doing the hard work to really keep ourselves safe. And then for your question about children, the data will tell us right now, what we are doing is I think being really smart about who is getting the vaccines based on what we know. This is why I keep saying, if you think you have it or you think you know someone who has it, please get them tested because the more cases we know of and where we know what's happening, the vaccines will follow. So if in the fall, we start to see a whole bunch of, um, you know, kids being being infected from schools or from other kids, because right now the kids that are being infected are getting infected from folks who are in their house, who may have had, who may, who are considered one of these high risk groups, right? Um, But if we start to see kids get infected because they're playing at the playground with Jimmy or so-and-so, you know, went to daycare and came back with it, what starts to happen is the conversation changes and we start to really talk about um, spreading, spreading the kind of coverage of vaccines to other at-risk groups like children. So only time will tell. It may be that it just doesn't spread effectively in that population. That would be amazing. Um, but who knows? It, it, you know, it might be something that, that we end up having to deal with. Great. Thank you for that, Dr. Safas. Does that mean that the vaccine that we currently have is has been tested and, and we know it's safe in children? No. So I'm telling you, we really can't have nice things. So we didn't test this vaccine um, super well in part because, and this is like an equity issue, in part because people who would make money off of it didn't see this as being a disease, monkeypox, smallpox, a disease that would happen in rich places where they can get paid for the vaccine. So there's a deeper, longer conversation here, but we are just now doing human tests of this vaccine. Um, There have been some tests done for the safety protocol, but we haven't done the kind of full suite of tests that we would normally do for a vaccine. So um, we don't know the data in kids. We don't know the data data in pregnant folks. Um, we, We know that it's safe in kind of most adults, and we know that it's effective from the studies that we've done in primates. Um, but there's a lot more information that's needed. Me, myself, if I was offered the vaccine tomorrow, I would be signing up to get it because the disease, in my opinion, is, is worse. Um, and one thing that they're going to do is they're giving out the vaccine is they're going to be monitoring to see if there's any issues that we have to deal with. The reason why we talk about the vaccines and I keep telling you guys there's another vaccine that isn't as good is because if we get to the point, like Tashi suggested, where kids are getting it, everyone's sick. The government may decide to release this secondary vaccine that's um, called ACAM 2000. ACAM 2000 is the vaccine that's only kind of there if there was a smallpox outbreak and everyone was dying because it has a really bad impact on the heart. It has some cardiovascular complications. So right now, 
monkeypox isn't killing people, so we don't need to use a vaccine that's super, super severe. But if the population starts to get a ton of it and people are saying, we need vaccines, and the only vaccines we have are ACAM 2000, that conversation may change. And so I just want you guys to be aware of, you know, why there's a kind of a question of why are we using all the vaccines we have? Like, what's the issue? Thank you. So um, a kind of along that line, we have a question that came out as well um, about the treatment and knowing kind of from our experience with COVID, knowing that this is a virus, so far uh, have we found any cases of variants or untreatable cases with the drugs available? No, so far, no. Um, again, which is why it matters that everyone who has it gets, uh, gets diagnosed because we can get ahead of finding variants the more folks we know that have it. But so far, it's been okay in terms of, um, it's seeming like it's, it's really um, uh, you know, mutating. If monkeypox mutates, right now monkeypox is a contact-based disease. Yes, it can spread through respiratory um, droplets, but it's contact-based is the best way for it to spread. If monkeypox was to mutate and to become more effective at spreading, I think the conversations that we were having exactly, I think as we're all talking about, the conversations around vaccinations would also change. Um, but right now it doesn't seem to be mutating, doesn't seem to be kind of spreading super effectively apart from sustained contact, which is really, really great news for all of us. Great, thank you. There's two other um, questions, which, and then I think we'll wrap up and go um, go to our exit polls. The first one is: Is it painful to cover the lesions? No, the lesions themselves are just very painful. Um, when you cover it, you'd have to make sure that the tape doesn't fall onto directly onto the lesion. If it's super painful to cover the lesions, my recommendation is really to wear kind of like non-easy breathing clothing. Um, and we only, I would only recommend covering those lesions if you have to be in public. You have to go out and you know do something where you, you can't really be fully covered, but then that's the only time that I'd recommend. Otherwise, we're gonna leave them open so you can go through the different stages that it has to go through to heal. Great, thank you. And then the last question that we have for now is, how about going shopping and trying on clothes? Could you get monkeypox from that? Mm, mm. Again, from theoretically, yes, if someone, who had active lesions went, tried on clothes, and then you went and tried on clothes and stayed in those clothes for a period of time. Let's say you're walking around the shop making sure it's really cute. Yes, you could you could potentially get it that way. But the idea that someone who had active lesions would be doing that, it doesn't seem as common. And again, most people don't wear clothes in, in, in um, stores for that long. You try it on, you take it off. And so this is, again, contact-based, but it's sustained contact. So you really wanna kind of be in it. Does this make me want to maybe wash my clothes before I wear them? Sure, but um, we just haven't seen it spread this way so far. It may change, and then I think we would change with it. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Safa. We're getting lots of comments. This has been super, super helpful. This information is so vital. Um, lot, people are saying that they're kind of the public health officer for their family. I know that a lot of people are in that role for their communities and their organizations and their workplaces. So this is just incredible. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing this info. And I'm going to turn it back to Tasha. I know we have an exit poll. We have an exit survey. Um, and we have a question about whether the recording will be available. Yes. And I will send it to um, to everyone who everyone who registered. All right. So we're going to um, get into the first. Um, and this is this will kind of be a little quiz for you all, right? Everyone who's who's here. I know this has been very informative. You all have been paying attention. So let's do a little quiz, okay? For question number one. Is monkeypox a sexually transmitted infection? True or false? Number two. Oh, let's, let's start with number one. Can you all see? Mm -hmm, yes. Number two. Is monkeypox a type of zoonotic virus? True or false? Number three. Is monkeypox, monkeypox can present like other infections. Is that true or is that false? Oh, I think number one and number three was trick questions. Are they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good thing is we, we still have our physicians here and they can talk us through. Yeah, yeah I see. Wow.
Okay. Oh, I can't wait to share these. <laughs> All righty. Come on. Don't be shy. You will not receive a report card. This will not go home to mom and dad. <laughs> okay. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna, gonna end the poll. All right. Let's share these results. So for question number one, 31% uh, of you believe that it's true. Monkeypox is sexually transmitted. Um, and 69% of you believe it's false. For number two, 62% uh, of you believe it's true. It's a zoonotic virus. And 38% of you believe it's false. And number three, 92% 92% believe that it can present like other infections and 8% believe that that is false. So Dr. Sappho. Sure. So I'm so impressed that you guys got the first one because I think it's confusing to everyone. Monkeypox is um, a disease that spreads through sexual contact, but it is not at this point considered a sexually transmitted infection. It's just a thing of kind of words the reason why I'm making sure to make sure people know that it's not a sexually transmitted infection is that if folks think it's a sexually transmitted infection like HIV and other STIs, they think that the only way they can get it is through sex. That is dangerous because you may end up being around someone who has monkeypox virus thinking, well, I'm not having sex with them, so I can't get it. And then you can get it because it's contact-based. So the easiest way to think about this is monkeypox is a contact-based disease, contact with the person with the rashes or contact with the materials that they've used like bedding and clothing. And because it's a contact-based disease, one of the ways that it can spread is through sexual interactions. And it's spread pretty effectively that way. For the second question is, is it a zoonotic virus? So just remember zoonotic just means by, by animals. And so, yes, it is an, it's, a, it's a virus that tends to be most effectively spread actually through animals. And it doesn't actually do a great job of coming into humans, which is why we got screwed because the fact that it's in humans and it's spreading human to human in the area that it's spreading is not normal. So monkeypox is a type of zoonotic virus. And then can it present like other infections? You guys are brilliant. Yes, it can absolutely present like any other infections that we see that tend to present with a rash. And the ones that we tend to kind of think of quite often is syphilis, um, as well as um, some of the like chickenpox and other viruses that, you know, people might end up um, mentioning. Um, I want to say though, that someone said, and I don't remember where I heard this, um, my short-term memory is gone from having a child. Let me see. So it might've been on social media, but somebody was talking about how the folks who are, the very folks who are kind of COVID deniers and anti-vaxxers may, God forbid, monkeypox becomes more spread in the community, may send their child who has a rash to school and say, well, it's just chickenpox, right? They shouldn't be sending their child anyway because chickenpox is very contagious and you shouldn't be sending them when they know that it could be monkeypox. And so it's important for us to just be mindful and again, without stigmatizing that um, it really can spread in ways that can be very, very problematic. Um, and because it looks like many other diseases, it's easy to come up with a different story. Oh, I just have a rash. Oh, I just have some eczema. Oh, I just have an, you know, acne. When you want to really be responsible, you want to make sure that you know what it is that you have so you can keep yourself and your community safe. So I will end on that. Note. And um, I wanted to, to bring up, um, since you mentioned it, right? Um, so... I haven't seen chicken pox in a very long time. And I, my understanding is that most of the children now are vaccinated from chicken mm -hmm. pox. Um, you know, my, my oldest child is 12. She never got it. I know many of us um, who got chicken pox, um, I guess telling my age, we were all like in kindergarten, you know, um, it's very early we got it and you wanted to get it early because I believe it was more painful. Um, more harmful to you if you got it as an adult. So um, my thing is, how often are we seeing cases of chicken pox still um, in children, and, or do they really just present in communities that opt not to have their children vaccinated? It is a really good question. We're not seeing it very commonly because as you've said in the last, I would say 20 years, it's been a real push to I'm make sure folks are... <laughs> <laughs> the folks are vaccinated. Um, the issue is, and this is in part the legacy of COVID, people are vaccinating their kids for all kind of pediatric vaccines less. And I know this is an area that Dr. Anu, who's a pediatrician, 
probably feels really sad about um, because when you leave kids unvaccinated, common things that we can prevent start to become an issue. So you're seeing the cases of polio that are rising now. If you're vaccinated against polio, you can sleep easy at night. You, you don't have to worry. You've been vaccinated, you're good. But if you are one of those parents, people who started to believe that all vaccines are bad and you leave your child unvaccinated, you could watch your child get sick, paralyzed or die from a condition that we can prevent. Um, and so we're seeing all kinds of, of conditions that we used to really control well come up. Measles outbreaks that we just, we didn't used to see measles. We're seeing outbreaks of measles. Pertussis is becoming more common. It's a cough-based infection. We're seeing all kinds of different um, things that are really out there and chickenpox is one of them. So yes, it isn't gonna be um, too odd to imagine that a parent will say, yeah, you have to deal with this rash. It's just chickenpox because chickenpox is definitely making a comeback. Um, and it's, it's just really unfortunate. It's all part of this kind of, desire to, to not use the science and medicine and preventative me methods that we know have worked for decades in keeping all of us safe. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple of comments in the chat. Um, chicken pox, polio, and measles are making a comeback. Um, uh, Antoinette wanted to know if chicken pox is now presenting in the water. I think that's polio. That's not chicken pox, correct? That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, Joanne said a lot of parents are embracing the anti-vax theory mm -hmm. and that it causes autism. I've been seeing a lot about that. Do you, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, there's just nothing to say, but it, the, it will be devastating for folks to watch their kids die of infectious diseases and never develop autism, but get impacted by something that we know we could have kept them safe from. The research that said that vaccines were associated with autism has been debunked. The, one of the main researchers who worked on it falsify the data, but like a lot of misinformation, it's too far gone to really get people to believe that. And so I really think, and I think you made this point, Tashi, about how like, it won't be until we have something that really impacts people themselves that they'll start to take things seriously. So monkeypox for those who are at risk, they're seeing their friends have these lesions on their face that are disfiguring and super painful. And even if they don't really believe in vaccines, they're like, hell, I'm gonna take it because it can help, right? And sadly, it won't be until folks are seeing friends who are also anti-vaxxers have kids that are sick from some of these conditions, you know, that they may start to kind of come around again. But in the meantime, I cannot say this enough. If you can get vaccinated for some of this stuff, get vaccinated. It just, it isn't worth taking the risk, especially if we have a vaccine. And COVID was a perfect example. Before the COVID vaccine, people died in the hundreds of thousands. You got COVID and it was literally a crapshoot. Now everyone and their mama has COVID and most people are okay, right? That's the power of the vaccines. Like nothing else did that for us than the actual vaccines. So um, I can't, I just can't emphasize enough kind of what we lose as a society when we move away from the technology that works. And in this case, the technology is vaccines. Uh, Loretta left a comment um, congratulating you on the birth of your beautiful daughter. Thank and, you. Um, she, she thanks us for um, this programming, this informative. Um, uh, Joanna says even research on long COVID in children is scary brain inflammation, cardiovascular disease. Um, okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna launch this. We have two more polls and we'll get you all out of here in time for dinner. Um, all right, so we wanna go back to a question that we posed in the beginning. Um, what is your knowledge level on orthopox virus now? So are you extremely knowledgeable? Are you very knowledgeable? Are you knowledgeable? Not very knowledgeable? Are you still lost? Um, how are you feeling about that? Your knowledge level on orthopox virus. And then number two, how vulnerable do you personally feel towards the virus? Um, extremely vulnerable, very vulnerable, vulnerable, somewhat vulnerable, not at all vulnerable. I doubt that I'll be exposed. And I'll give you all a moment um, to enter. And then I want to kind of go ahead and um, compare what your answers are now versus what they were when we began. All right. And then, as always, if you do not see the poll, feel free to, to, um, to leave your answer in the chat. And we'll see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So 14% of you say that you are very knowledgeable, and that is a 14% increase from the beginning <laughs> of, <laughs> of this webinar. Um, 45% of you say that you, I'm sorry, extremely knowledgeable was the 14%. 45% of you say that you are very knowledgeable, and that is a 30% increase from the beginning of this webinar. 41% of you say that you're somewhat I'm sorry, 41% uh, of you say that you are knowledgeable um, and that is another 30% increase. Um, no one is not very knowledgeable and, and no one is lost. So that's a great thing. Um, vulnerability. All right, so 5% of you feel extremely vulnerable. That's gone down 2% from the beginning of this webinar. 14% of you feel very vulnerable and that's gone down 6% from the beginning. 23% um, of you feel vulnerable, and that's gone up 6% from the beginning. 55% of you somewhat vulnerable, and that has gone up by 12% from the beginning. And 5% of you still doubt that you will be exposed, and that number has gone down 15% from the beginning. Okay. We have done good work. We have done very good work. One, we want to know again how you're feeling. How do you feel about how do you feel today about Orthodox virus in your community? Are you still over it? Tired, frustrated, scared, not worried, it'll pass, prepared, unprepared, a bit worried, or do you feel like this is our new normal? Are you numb? Your feelings matter. And please, I know we've uh, we dropped it in the chat a couple of times. Please, 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 we want you to take our survey um, via Survey Monkey, no relation to the monkeypox. We're going to take uh, that survey so we can know how you feel about this programming. Okay. All right. Okay. So 4% of you are over it. That's down 2% from the beginning. No one's tired. Um, and that's down another 2% from the beginning. Um, frustrated. That is up 1% from the beginning. Scared. That's up Good Lord, <laughs> that's up about 17% from the beginning. Um, no one is worried. Um, they believe it's gonna pass. That is, what is that? That's down 3%. 31% um, of you feel prepared. And that is up 28% from the beginning. No one feels unprepared. 23% of you feel a bit worried, and that is down 19%. And 15% of you feel like this is the new normal, and that is down 7% from the beginning. This is great. Thank you so much for taking the time to do these polls, because I think what it really shows is that everyone's knowledge level has moved up. Oh, my God. Um, and that appropriately people are probably feeling a little more vulnerable and maybe a little bit more worried, but also more prepared. And I think that's a really sober and realistic place to be in, more knowledgeable, a little bit more aware of our personal risk. So we're a little bit more vigilant, but also more prepared. So thank you so much to Dr. Safo for taking us in that direction and for giving us this beautiful end to our evening. Where oh, we get to this she's incredible. beautiful. Yeah. Please, please, introduce, beautiful. please introduce our, our webinar hi. baby. Say, hi, my name is Amara Joy and today I'm three months old. Gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks y'all, I appreciate it. She demands my attention, so I will jump off, but it's been wonderful speaking with you all. <laughs> so much as, as um as always thank you for coming thank you for giving us all of this great information and and putting it in language that we can understand 
um, and comprehend really well. Um, we appreciate you, Dr. Sappho. Enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. I'm going to take a little screenshot for her so she remembers the first webinar she joined. <laughs> okay, everybody. Uh, take care, y'all. <laughs> Have a good night. Be well, everyone. Be well. Everyone Bye. be well. Take care. Thank, Thank you. Bye, beautiful you baby. <laughs> And please, please do the um, the survey as you all exit. Have a good night. We'll see you for the next one. And I'll be sure to send the uh, the recording. Thank you, Tashi. You are welcome. All right, let me stop recording.